<clears throat> so we'll go ahead and and we're just going to talk about we're going to bring in alkynes now and as we might expect alkynes and alkenes have a lot of similarities because they both involve carbon carbon pi bonds um, the only difference really with alkene with alkynes is that um, you have two pi bonds between the same two carbons as opposed to only one pi bond. Um, so uh, there was this was a not the the problems that we did for the for the homework assignment. Um, we can go through some of these that these are just sort of practice review. Um, so I think we'll save those for a little bit later if we have time to do some practice. It's in there. I cleaned these up, but that didn't make it. Much. I must not have hit save on my other computer before we closed it down. All right. So when it comes to naming alkynes, name them just like you do alkenes. Um, Pentane, pentene, pentine. The, just like with the alkenes, we still need to, to specify where the triple bond is, um, but it works the same way. You name the, the first of the two carbons in the, the alkyne bond. Um, the lower number. Yeah, so you, it's not one, two pentene or one, two pentine, although that would kind of make sense. Um, but that's just not the way that the, the standard was developed. You just say the first number. Um, and the nice thing here is we, do we need to worry about E and Z for, or cis and trans for alkynes? Be like, I don't know exactly if it's SP2, but it would it be a similar geometry. It's SP, SP, yeah, it's SP. So SP, okay, right, SP3 yeah. is tetrahedral, SP2 is trigonal planar, SP is the hybridization here. Okay. Um, but in terms of in terms of the way that the um the double bond is oriented, where we if it was an alkene, we could have E versus the Z, right? E was against and Z was on the same side. So do we need to worry about that for alkynes? I think so. There's only one thing attached oh, to each can't side, right? Bonds with anything else because right. it has two pi bonds. And so the, and if it's SP, what's the geometry on it? So SP3 was tetrahedral, trigonal planar. What's if you only have two electron groups? It's linear, right? Okay. So there is not, there's not two places to put things. Okay. It's just a straight line, which means it looks a little bit weird when you, when you write them out, um, because like it's showing here, um, if it's a straight line and we're trying to draw this to show the bonds uh, in approximately the right angles, it can get really tricky to show an alkyne with the right number of carbons. You'll notice that it actually, like it, it uh, disconnects the alkyne from the rest of the chain to show that that's the alkyne because otherwise you wind up with something like one, two, three, four. Like one, long one long bond. So you have to be really, really careful to show that it's that there's a and carbon right here. So it's standard to leave like a little gap. During That's you see it that way. It, otherwise, you just make a really big point of of making sure that your pi bonds on either side of your main chain stop halfway through, and it's an extra long line that's very, very clearly double the normal length. Yeah, because of the geometry being straight. Exactly. Um, so while we, we don't have to deal with E and Z, we do have to worry about that a little bit, but it winds up being, being pretty easy to tell as long as we're careful drawing them. So let's do a practice problem naming. <clears throat> 
All right, so two things to keep in mind here, just like with the alkenes, and when we see um, we get into oxygen-based functional groups, it's, it's no longer about what's the longest continuous carbon chain. It's the longest continuous carbon chain that has our dominant functional group. And there's there's sort of there's a priority list for what functional groups are the most important functional groups, but effectively it's going to be um, basically whatever looks the most complicated typically is going to be which you and whatever is at the end of the name is going to be the most dominant functional group. So if we have if it's an alkyne and we name it by adding Y and E to the end, that makes the alkyne the most important functional group. So does that make it the first part of the, when you start counting them? And that also means that that's the number we want to keep as low as possible. Okay. Yeah, so it's one, if you have an alkyne at the end of a carbon chain, if there's no other functional groups, that alkyne is the most important functional group, and it has to be carbon between carbons one and two, even if that makes your branches higher numbers. Would it be possible for another functional group to take precedence over the? Okay. Yeah, and but typically it's going to be the one that you name you put at the end of the name. So if we went, um, if we had. Uh, Actually, we'll, we'll go with um, just an alcohol instead. We name alcohols by add, by dropping the E at the end of our normal name and adding an OL. So if it's an alkyne, that's also an alcohol, it's gonna be alkin all. So in this case, it's what? One, two, three, four, five, six carbons long. So it's going to be hexine, but we're going to drop the, the E at the end of hexine and put OL. And so, and this is going to be one where we do have to put the one in the middle. So hexinol or hexine one all. And the, because the OL is at the end, because the alcohol oxygen based functional groups take precedence over carbon based functional groups, the OL is the most dominant functional group. So that gets the one in which would make it five hexine all. Five hexine one all. You see how that, whatever that last syllable is, and when it's an, if it's an acid or if it's an alk, um, if it's a um, ketone, we add those by dropping the E. And then adding specific, like a ketone, you add O-N-E, or a, an uh, aldehyde, you add A-L, or a carboxylic acid, you add um, oic acid to the end. But that's always going to be after you drop the E. So your alkenes, your alkynes, functional groups, and anything that you name with a prefix is going to be less important than those other functional groups. Um, it's just, it's something that takes a little bit of practice. And we'll we'll get more practice at it. And that's why we kind of go one functional group at a time. We get used to it. And typically the later we add the functional group, the higher priority it is. Yeah, repetition. Yeah, yeah exactly. The problems, yeah. And again, you could say hept one ein or one heptine. Hept one ein is sort of the newer new school way of doing it. Um, but it doesn't look like it's a real word. Yeah. Then, um, so one heptine is still perfectly acceptable. The only time you have to put the number in the middle is when you have those two functional groups, like we just talked about. You you have to put the one for the alcohol in the middle of the word because you have to the number in front of the word has to specify where the alkyne is. The number in the middle specifies where the alcohol is. Um, but again, we'll get more practice with that. <clears throat> 
All right, when it comes to when it comes to the shape of these, the alkenes and the alkynes, like I mentioned before, they both have pi bonds between two carbons. And in both cases, um, we get a sigma bond in the middle and then the pi bonds forming on, on each side made up of unhybridized P orbitals, just like before. The only 90 degrees, the pi bonds. Exactly. So when it is two pi bonds, remember that all of our P orbitals had to be by definition, they were 90 degrees from each other. They were along the X axis or along the Y axis or along the Z axis when we first learned about the shape of these orbitals, right? Yeah. So if we're going to try and make a pi bond out of unhybridized P orbitals, they're by definition going to have to be um, orthogonal to each other. Have you taken linear? Linear algebra? No. So and you probably don't need to for environmental science, um, but th to go into the, the theory a little bit of the, the quantum for how these work, all of these different functions that make up for the entire molecule, not just on one atom, by definition, they have to be orthogonal to each other. And orthogonal means linearly independent functions, which in three-dimensional space, if we're dealing with straight lines, means that they have to be 90 degrees from each other. But because we're dealing with more complicated functions that have I involved and that are in spherical coordinates, um, and they're these trigonometric functions, um, they don't have to be truly 90 degrees from each other, um, which is how you get things like the orbitals in, or, or um, you know, bonds that are 120 degrees from each other. Um, is by mixing them together. They're still technically orthogonal, but they're not orthogonal in terms of three-dimensional space because they don't behave. They're not in three-dimensional space um, in terms of matrices, the way the matrices behave. Um, but all that aside, these pi bonds have to be 90 degrees from each other, at least oriented about 90 degrees from each other. Um, but they're gonna have more or less the same shape, which is helpful because we just went through a whole bunch of reactions for pi bonds, carbon, carbon, pi bonds, right? So we're gonna see a lot of the same reactions for alkynes, but the fact that they either they will either have to happen twice because we have two pi bonds that can react, or they're going to leave something that looks a little bit different. Turns out if you, if for example, if you do a hydration reaction on an alkyne, you get an alkene is still left over with an oxygen attached to it, with an alcohol attached to it, which will rearrange those electrons um, to, to form a different functional group. So we get subtle differences from the same reactions as a result of the fact that it's an alkyne versus an alkene. Mechanisms are similar, but the- Mechanisms are identical. It just does one rearrangement at the end. For, for some of them, for most of them. Um, if we want to make an alkyne, so the first the first step in all these chapters, the new functional groups is, okay, so how do we make this? Um, well, we made an alkene by going, by taking an alkyl halide and putting it through, putting it through an elimination reaction, right? If we're going to do that, if we have a dihalide, and we put it with a strong base, we can eliminate both of those halogens. And so we, we call it a double elimination and you wind up making, um, you wind up making a di pi bond, an alkyne. Do they have to be on the same carbon or could it be one on one carbon? One on they the can be side? adjacent. Adjacent, right, yeah. Um, but we still are going to be somewhat limited in the sense that it's going to still try to follow a Zaitsev's rule. If we're using a small, strong base, it's still going to try to make the most substituted alkene. And so that's going to dictate where we put our double bond, just like before, um, with one exception. If we use a strong enough base and we use enough of it, if we use excess, we can actually wind up 
um, it, it'll go through a double elimination and then it'll actually deprotonate if you wind up with um, with a terminal alkyne, an alkyne at the end of the carbon chain, it'll actually deprotonate that alkyne um, because having that carbon hydrogen bond on an alkyne, that's not a very strong bond. That makes it a rather acidic proton if you have a strong enough base. In fact, it's a strong enough base, it'll actually rearrange to basically move the pi bonds to the end of a carbon chain so that it can deprotonate it. Um, so basically that's, that's sort of the nuclear option and it kind of forces everything to go to the end of the carbon chain and then pulls the hydrogen off. So the pi bonds can jump down a carbon chain? Maybe? Basically it goes through, we can, we can track what the steps look like, but basically it's a lot like a, a um, carbocation rearrangement in reverse. Um, where you wind up with the height with the hydrogens moving over, which results in the pi bond moving the opposite direction. Um, and that it'll keep going multiple steps. This is a case where it actually will go multiple steps. It'll move all the way to the end of the carbon chain by doing that. It's a enough thermodynamic driving force. It's more stable when it's at the end of the chain than... when it's with a super strong base like amide. Oh, okay. Because it's that super strong base is so good at pulling electrons and protons away from, or pulling protons away from things, it'll rearrange the molecule so that there's an acidic proton. Um, we typically see it done when something is already close to, to the end. We try not to rely on it doing multiple rearrangements. It is observed to happen. But usually you get something more like, you know, if you have a couple of, of halides on carbon two or three, it'll it'll basically all turn into a terminal alkyne. Um, and that if this was just a, if this was just two carbons, it'd be acetylene, and we call it an acetylide ion once it's deprotonated. Technically, if it's just an R group, it's called an alkenide ion. Um, I still typically slip up and I'll just call it an acetylide ion, regardless of how many carbons there are, um, just because that's a much more common term to use. But so I kind of use them interchangeably. I shouldn't refer to the alkene bond. Just a, yeah, exactly. When you have a deprotonated terminal alkyne, it's an alkenide, but I sometimes call it an acetylide. Um, and it does have to be a pretty strong base to do this, because if you look at these pKa values, um, hydroxide has a pKa of fifteen point seven, uh, and the and an a alkanide ion is a pKa of about twenty five. It'll change a little bit depending on what your R group is, but it's going to be around twenty five. But that means that it favors um, the alkanide will deprotonate water um, by, by a factor about 10 to the 9. It'll favor the deprotonating the water to, to put the proton back on the alkanide, make it the alkyne. Um, the pKa for, a sub, for amide, for ammonia, is something in the 30s. So you have to pick something with a pKa that's greater than 25 for this process to happen. And if there's any water around, it'll ruin the reaction because you'll wind up with the, the amide stealing protons from the water instead of stealing protons from the acetylide or from the alkanide. We're getting into, into reactions where um, like the worst possible thing that you could do is have water present. Um, because we saw that a lot with our hydration reactions too, right? You don't want the water involved until you're ready for it or else it ruins things. You skip steps. Um, so we'll, we do a lot of make sure it's dry by adding the magnesium sulfate or make sure it's dry. When we do Grignard reactions, you have to actually take all of your glassware and bake it in the oven overnight 
um, and then take it out and, ass and assemble it while it's still hot with hot with gloves on um, and then seal it so that there's no chance of even residual moisture from from the atmosphere getting in there. If there's any moisture on the inside of the glass, that ruins everything. You're working like on a rainy day by the ocean. That could be really difficult. Right. And so they at a, a place like that where they rely on it, that they actually have big enough ovens. We have a tiny oven here. You've seen the inside of that thing. Yeah. Um, they actually have ovens that are large enough that you can assemble your entire glassware setup and put it in the oven okay. with it, with the valves open. Cool. And those Teflon um, stopcocks are actually, they're resistant enough to temperature. They won't melt. They seem like they're just plastic, but they're actually solid Teflon, um, which, you know, as you know, from, from cooking, Teflon handles high temperatures pretty well without melting, right? Yeah. So you actually just set the whole thing up heat it up like crazy. And then um, they even have some fume hoods that you can close and the entire fume hood is a is an oven as well. Wow. Okay. Um, we don't have that here. So what we do is we just assemble it quickly while it's hot. And then um, if it seemed like it closed down or if it's a humid day, we'll leave the valve open and then hit the whole thing with a heat gun. Okay. Um, until to drive out anything that's still left. And then when it's good and hot, then seal it um, before. And then that's that's why it's really important to use those dropping funnels mm -hmm. rather than, than just opening the whole thing up and yeah. dumping stuff in there. You put it in the dropping funnel. Maintain a seal. You maintain drop. a seal that way. Yeah. All right, so for either of these, for both of these, what do we get if we have excess, excess amide? or at least three equivalents of amide. Um, the other way that sometimes we show these these alkynes to avoid miscounting carbons is to actually write out the carbons that are part of the alkyne. So something like it's not it's not truly skeletal structure to show it that way, yeah. but that's one way to make sure that you people know what you're saying. So the first thing we make. When we do this, first we're going to deprotonate it once, or sorry, uh, I'll do one elimination and we'll get the alkene. Then it'll do a second elimination, pull off the other bromine and make the alkyne. And then if there's excess, it'll do that deprotonation step as well. And we typically use excess just to use equilibrium in Le Chatelier's principle to drive it way towards the products. It's a strong enough base that you don't need to that much. But it can be a little doing these double eliminations. You can't really do. I'm going to do just one equivalent of my base and get get an alkene because it winds up being a little unpredictable that way. What you'll actually get if you do that is some of it will be alkene, but some of it will be alkyne, and some of it will be unreacted. Um, so typically, we to avoid that, we just use the excess and say, okay, we're not stopping halfway. We're going all the way. Just keep driving. It'll just keep driving it, and so. After step one, we wind up with it deprotonated. So step two is just to come back and say, okay, well, if we don't want it deprotonated, if we don't want the alkanide ion, we just want the alkyne, expose it to water, and it'll repro do a quick proton transfer from the water. So we actually wind up with our final answer. Looks like that would look like that with water present, and then there's still water present. So sometimes we we use the water to sort of use up extra reactant. Um, there's a couple like when we do reduction reactions, um, 
and we started looking at sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride, they're nasty enough that when we're done with our organic molecule reacting, we'll add a little bit of excess of them to make sure that all of our product gets made. But then we'll come back and we'll just add a little bit of water in there just so whatever leftover reactant is still in there is not dangerous anymore. Yep. And then we come back and remove the water by doing a distillation or adding magnesium sulfate. Um, water is like a proton source for it? Basically, yeah. Right. Water is just a good way. It's In this case, it's just a proton source. In some cases, you wind up um, either uh, reducing the hydrogen on water or some other side reaction that happens with the water to use up whatever whatever nasty stuff is still there. And then we do the purification. But a lot of times, that's why you'll see step two, add water. And it just finishes making it stable. Okay. Like stabilizes like unstable reactants. So exactly. Okay. Exactly. We don't want to add the water right away because we need to make our, the unstable product first. But then to use up the rest of the amide, we'll add the water. And I believe we get the exact same thing for B, right? It's drawn a little differently. The chlorines aren't on the same carbon, but it'll do the same exact thing. And we still wind up with yeah. four carbons in a row and a terminal alkyne, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the, the easiest way to make the alkynes is just to do this double elimination. So that's, you know, anytime you see the excess sodium amide, um, that's your your giveaway that you're probably looking at a double elimination. Because that's a strong base. It's a really strong base. So it's really good at promoting eliminations to the point that it'll also deprotonate at the end. The other handy thing about the deprotonating these is that if you wind up with if you wind up with um, a deprotonated alkyne at the end, so a deprotonated deprotonated alkane is one of the strongest bases. So not even sodium amide is strong enough to do that. Um, but uh, the amide ion is strong enough to deprotonate to deprotonate hydrogen gas. You can take H2 and expose it to amide and you'll make hydride ions. Um, but the, and the nice thing that's really useful about these is that anything with a negative charge in a lone pair is a nucleophile, right? And the stronger the base, the better the nucleophile it is. So we can actually make these carbons into nucleophiles by deprotonating them. So if we wanted to add two carbons to something else, we could start by making those two carbons into an acetylide or an alkanide ion, and then expose it to something that has a good leaving group in the spot where we want to add these. And we can get it to go through an SN2, basically, and add carbons that way. Similar to what I was talking about on Tuesday with the magnesium bromide, the Grignard reaction. Um, it basically will do the same thing. That Grignard reaction was, was a carbon, an R group attached to magnesium bromide, right? Um, this is a, a way to do it without using a metal, which can be, depending on what how many carbons you're trying to add, this can actually be more favorable. Um, or if you have more than one step afterwards, I think if we want to then take this and put our product and then put it through a couple more reactions because we wind up with a new, a new um, alkyne attached to whatever had a good leaving group before. So if we change so that our second step is not add water and, and if we start from an alkyne 
um, we don't need to say excess amide. If we're starting from a terminal alkyne, when we add the amide to it, we're going to make that terminal alkanide ion. And then that negative charge is going to attack whatever carbon has a good leaving group and go through an SN2. So for this first one, we've got one, two, three, four, five carbons being added to two carbons. So we're going to wind up adding carbon one right there. So instead of being a terminal alkyne now, it's still going to be five carbons on the alkyne side. And then on the, on the other side, where it was a terminal alkyne, we're going to add one, two more carbons. Where, so the, um, the iodine is the leaving group that comes out. Yeah, iodine is the leaving group. That just to the ion of the alkyne. Exactly. So we wind up making, and technically we don't really have this balanced. We would wind up making um, iodide because we wind up with we wind up making uh, sodium iodide, I guess, would be our final. Okay. Right, because that sodium amide, the amide turns into ammonia when it steals a, hydro, or a uh, proton. And now that's neutral. And the sodium ion is going to be balanced out by the iodide that leaves. And then we wind up putting all of our carbons together. And it's just a matter of attaching the carbons in the right spot. And it's always just take your terminal alkyne, replace that hydrogen gets turned into a negative charge, basically. So you're going to replace that carbon hydrogen bond with the new carbon carbon bond wherever the leaving group was attached. Um, and so we, we also see this really commonly acetylene is the common name for ethyne, C2H2. So acetyl, you know, welding gas is just, is just that. So that's a really common molecule to go. Like if we wanted to do some of these reactions, we could literally go to the welding gas store, buy some acetylene in a tank and use it as a reactant. Um, so if we take acetylene and expose it to the amide, we make the acetylide, it'll just pull off one of these. It wouldn't pull off both because it would be unstable. So just like remember with with um our remember our polyprotic strong acids with like sulfuric acids, H2SO4? Only the first proton was a strong proton, right? And then it got su successively harder to pull the other ones off. Yeah, okay. Same thing here. It's It can pull off the first proton. The second proton all of a sudden is so hard to pull off that you're never going to see, I don't know, diacetylide ion. It'd be a negative two charge. It'd be a negative two charge. It'd be super unstable. It, so I, I think you would wind, I don't think you could do that, at least not with, not with a mind. Um, so we don't have to worry about that too much. And we just typically don't do it with excess. If we're only trying to pull off one of these, if we're dealing with the acetylene, we don't need to do a double elimination first usually. So we just kind of avoid the excess that way. You don't really have to worry about it accidentally happening. Right. And I, I don't think it would, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but, um, I think it'd be pretty much impossible to do that. Um, if you look at the difference in pKa's, uh, phosphoric acid is a good example because it's got three protons on it, right? The first proton has a pKa of like two, 
second proton has a pKa of eight and the third proton has a pKa of 12, something like that. You have to get really basic to pull the last hydrogen off a of phosphate. Yeah. Um, and so we'd be looking at, this is a lot less stable than a phosphate even. So I think I'm, I feel pretty safe in saying we're not gonna see that. Okay. Thanks. Of course. Um, so then the same general gist here, once you have it deprotonated, you're just gonna bring it in and attach there. So now we're gonna have a total of four carbons, our iodine leaves. And we're adding two new carbons. Does the ion have to leave on itself, or does the um, the ion like force it to leave? It's typically going to go in SN two. SN2, it's a strong yeah. enough nucleophile that it'll force it okay. to go SN two. Um, if we had a complicated enough molecule that it was trying to go SN. One, for steric reasons, that's going to complicate things, and we're probably going to have to think hard about whether or not it would happen. Um, because, we, as we know, strong nucleophiles typically aren't great at doing um, at doing SN1. It, it, would, it probably what would happen if it was this, if it was in a, that leaving group is in a tertiary carbon, we'd probably wind up with another elimination happening. And having our satellite just act as the base. So if we take our product from the, I have drawn in black here, we still have a terminal alkyne, right? Which means if we exposed it to amide again, now we can pull off the other proton. It'll attach another side. And it would attach to the other side. So that's the other reason why acetylene is so useful is because you can do this two times in a row and sort of build up your molecule from both sides. So in the second one, we just have methyl iodide as our, as our um, uh, leading group. So we're just going to add another methyl group to the other side now. So we wind up with And just like with the alkenes, um, it can be helpful to put your functional group that you're going to be left with in the middle. So you can just add to both sides so you don't have to reorient yourself too much. So we, we would wind up with, now we all, all of a sudden we have an alkyne in the middle of the molecule too. If we just looked at it the other way, it can be kind of tricky to put the, the alkyne bond where you want it. Because typically we're not going to stop, if we're doing a synthesis problem, we're not going to stop with an alkyne. Um, typically what we're going to do is, okay, now that we have our carbons all where we want them, now we're going to put the alkyne through some more reactions that'll do something like, you know, a hydration. So this is like what you'd use to make like the carbon chain. You exactly. Need. They call this building the carbon skeleton. skeleton. Um, and it works, you know, if you have a cyclohexane, cyclo hexyl or iodocyclohexane or something like that. That's a really good building block here because you can add, build from that pretty easily. Um, aromatics throw a wrench in things, but we'll learn reactions specific to aromatics um, in, in a few chapters. All right. Let's go, we'll go through a couple, one more reaction before we take a break since we started a little bit late. Um, because we have the two pi bonds, like I said, it, we're all the same terms are going to apply <clears throat> to alkyne reactions. Usually it just means we can do it twice. You can do two hydrogenations to take an alkyne to being an alkane. <clears throat> you can do a hydrohalogenation where you add hydrogen to one side and a halogen to the other, and you can do it twice if you wanted to turn it to being back to being a, a dibromide, for instance. Um, you can do regular halogenation where you added a bromine to each side of the pi bond. So we could actually make a tetrabromo compound 
um, by doing this. And some of them we can control just by making the, um, by controlling the stoichiometry. So like for instance, but it, hydro hydrogenation in particular, because it has that catalytic um, property, we can't just say, oh, okay, so it makes a lot of sense. If you had two equivalents of hydrogen gas, you make, you hydrogenate both of the pi bonds. But we can't just take one equivalent of hydro hydrogen to make the alkene. Um, it doesn't work that way because it's catalytic and it's on the surface. Remember that it was that it relied on our alkene kind of sticking to the surface. Yeah, it's like a flat one. To right. Back. And so with that in mind, you really wind up with if you try to do this with an alkyne and you only wanted to hydrogenate half of them, you're going to wind up with whatever molecules stick to the surface and react once will then react twice um, before another molecule has a chance to come in there. So instead of hydrogenating all of the molecules once, you wind up hydrogenating half of them twice. Does it's basically what Go ahead. Oh, no, because some of them are like taking up the space on the catalyst. Right. And the catalyst won't let go of it until it's fully hydrogenated. Oh, okay. So once it starts the process, it finishes the process and then lets it go. Okay. And so you just run out of hydrogen before you could actually, um, before you could get them to, to go halfway. Okay. Um, it's very predictable that way. You get almost exactly a 50% yield. Um, and 50% of it stays as the alkyne, um, which is not all that helpful from a synthesis perspective if we're trying to get it to stop halfway. If we want 100% of the molecules to react once instead of 50% reacting twice. And so we use, they um, figure out a way to do this by basically tweaking the catalyst so it's not as good of a catalyst. They make, they, the original term was called calling it a poisoned catalyst. You basically make it, you ruin the surface a little bit. Um, and so the, the name that is associated with it is called the Lindler's catalyst. If you use Lindler's catalyst, um, you wind up only hydrogenating it once and you only make the cis molecule. And so they, they first tried this with palladium, but palladium was almost as good a catalyst as platinum. So that didn't work, but they, they took the palladium and then they basically ruined parts of it selectively um, with exposing it to carbonates and little bits of lead oxide. Is you allowed to leave it easier for me? Yeah, basically. Okay. Um, it's not bound as well because we, we made it so that there was less, um, less pull for the electron density. So when there's a triple bond, when it's a double pi bond, it'll stick there pretty well. But once it reacts once, something about the geometries, and, and this would be something that, um, that my research group would have looked at, like trying to figure out what the heck is actually happening. They know experimentally this is how it works, but can we explain it as a mechanism? Uh, because this is such a weird aspect of what is it about this surface that makes it not work as well? Um, is it a sterics thing? Is it an electron density thing? Is there some side reaction? Does the Lindler's catalyst get eventually lose CO2 molecules and, and not work anymore? Um, but it's, it's definitely, it's not something we're going to spend a lot of time on the catalyst or on the mechanism for, because I don't believe it's, it's that well understood at this point. Surface science is a weird little niche that's not as very well studied. There's a lot of study in material science and in bulk properties, and there's a lot of studies in gas phase reactions. Mm -hmm. Stuff that happens on the surface, though, is yeah. still actively being researched. You see the products, but it's hard to know how they get to there. Exactly. Exactly. This is a place where, where experiment has, has far outstripped our ability to explain it with theory. So the theoretic, there's a lot of theoretical science still to be done. Cool. Um, which then leads to more experimental science, right? Because as soon as you can explain this, then some experimentalist that, that can understand that's going to come in and say, oh, well, I, if I, I can take advantage of that, I, if I just rearrange things a little bit more.
and I can make it so, you know, whatever, so that it does this for aromatics or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so chemical engineering side is more trying to uh, reach into the theory and like get into the, like explaining that how it works practically or I can use it. So there's, yes. Um, when you said practical use for it, chemical engineering is either trying, generally is either optimizing processes that already exist scaling up processes because a lot of processes occur at what we call the, the bench scale or lab scale but we can't scale them up to industrial scale necessarily scale up is a big problem um, and then they try to monetize things how do we do it economically how do we improve yields how do we take this idea and turn it into a product so that chemist made teflon for the first time a chemical engineer figured out how to put teflon on a pan and market it yeah um and so there's a lot of but even within chemistry there's sort of a division you're either a theoretical chemist or an experimental chemist and the experimental chemist is concerned with making things work in the lab or just like mix and match and guess and check see what happens when i do this versus the theoretical chemists are the ones that try and go in there and try and explain what the experimentals have already done or maybe give them new avenues to go down Interesting. Um, and you even have that with the chemical chemical engineers too. My the stuff that I did theoretical chemistry in a chemical engineering department. My goal was to try and come up with a new polymer for organic photovoltaics that could be something that the experimentalists hadn't tried yet. Trying to understand how organic photovoltaics worked, and then come up with a new molecule, and then say, "Hey, why don't you go try making this." And see if it works the way that I think it will. Yeah, based on like what theoretically. Right. Uh, should and then the experimental chemical engineers would try it and then say, oh, yeah, we got better efficiencies. We can coat this on stuff better or we can get more yield or we can make more money. Um, it, it all has every scientist does a little engineering and every engineer does a little bit of science. Yeah. Every research engineer does a little bit of science. Interesting to hear like the dynamics of the field. And, yeah. It is. I thought they would be I thought it was going to be the same when I looked at like what the research was happening, I'm like, oh, this is, this is just like cool applied chemistry research. Yeah. It's going to be just like being in a chemistry department. And it was totally different. Um, but that's, that's beside the point. Yeah. Um, all right, let's, let's take a break and we'll come back and we'll do these two practice problems and we'll say, and let's come back at, uh, at five after. Yeah. And I need to go grab my water bottle. Real quick. Okay.
All right. So what do we get? It's it's not that we've reached the high volume part of OCHEM now, right? Where the, there's not that much in terms of the mechanism. It's just getting fluent with the reactants. Um, if we have this reaction happen with Lindler's catalyst and one equivalent of hydrogen, it actually doesn't matter how much hydrogen we use. We can't force it to go to do the du double hydrogenation with Lindler's catalyst. So we'll wind up with same thing, except just at the double bond and just make sure that if it's in the middle of a molecule, you're only going to make the cis product. Um, and typically we don't have to worry about without kinds, we don't need to worry about triple bonds or oh, sorry, ring structures that often. Um, because we could have cyclohexene pretty easily, right? Because that's not all that different than the standard geometry. You can't really have cyclohexine just because there's too much ring stru or um, strain structure, strain energy, excuse me, there. By it's trying to be 180 degrees and you're forcing it to be 120 degrees. That's on each of those carbons. That's a pretty big amount of strain. So in order to have a cyclo, a cycloalkyne, you have to have at least eight carbons in the ring. You can make cyclooctyne. That's just because of the ring strain. Exactly. You can make cyclooctyne, but it still has a significant amount of ring strain, and it's not that commonly observed. Um, we use it in, there are certain reactions that we use where a strained alkyne we're reacting with something else um, produces a pretty much an irreversible reaction. Uh, yeah. um, so there's a series of, of reactions called click reactions um, that they, they call them that because it's like buckling a seatbelt. Cyclooctyne is relatively stable. Another molecule is not that stable, but stable enough. And if, but if you attach them, if you put them together, you get a structure that is almost impossible to break apart. Um, and so we actually do this, they do this in um, biochem research when they want to track where a specific molecule or specific protein is going inside a cell. Um, you can basically add a cyclooctyne group to green fluorescent protein. And then you add an azide, which is the, the other part of the click reaction, um, to, to the protein you're trying to track, to the, just to the end of it, in a place it's not going to affect the function. And when you put them together, you effectively seatbelt link your, your, you chain your green fluorescent protein to the protein you're trying to study. And then when you shine light on it, it glows green, wherever part, whatever organelles that protein is being moved to. That's like a tagging molecule? Exactly. They use it as a tagging molecule. I've heard about that. And it's cool to see like how it actually works. Yeah, this is the chemistry behind it awesome. is by doing that click reaction. But other than that, that's just a cool aside. Um, for the most part, and especially in this class, we're not going to deal much with cyclo cycloalkynes. So that limits how much we need to worry about the stereochemistry. If we can make a trans alkene, but we have to use a very different and very, very nasty reaction, um, which is called a dissolving metal reduction, um, where we, we uh, once again, can't have any water present. Um, and it still doesn't even give great results as far as the yield goes. So you only have a yield of, of 80%. Um, and you notice that's... That's not a sodium ion. Oh, it's doing that to be weird. Um, it's that's sodium metal. So you need sodium metal, and you do this reaction with liquid ammonia as the solvent. Um, and liquid ammonia has a boiling point that's around minus forty or minus seventy Celsius. So you have to do this at like dry ice temperatures, um, with so with sodium metal, which 
you might remember from Gen Chem explodes when you put it in water. <laughs> and and uh, liquid ammonia is also really, really nasty. Like the ammonia that they put in cleaning products, that's maybe 5% um, by, by mass. So liquid ammonia is very nasty stuff. And this is another one where I don't think we have, yeah, we don't have the mechanism that well understood. Um, and it's the ammonia is acting as more than just the solvent though, because you can't do this with other um, other solvents besides water. Um, but the net result is we get a trans alkene instead of the cis alkene, which except in some pharmaceuticals in general, we don't want trans alkenes. In general, we would prefer cis alkenes, especially if we're doing something for, for human consumption, right? Um, so, but then again, alkynes aren't that common in nature anyway. So this isn't something we don't typically have to do a hydrogenation, a partial hydrogenation of an alkyne to make, you know, partially hydrogenated soybean oil. We're trying to hydrogenate that to make it more like a saturated fat, not to keep it at an alkene. You just go in the other direction. Yeah, exactly. We would just double hydrogenate it. If we actually did have an alkyne that we wanted to make for human consumption, we'd just do the double hydrogenation. Um, but I can't think of a time when you would want that. But then again, synthetic chemists are famous for coming up with, well, we need to make this molecule here because that we found some use for it somewhere, even though it never occurs in nature. And it might be a pharmaceutical, it might have an engineering application, um, who knows, synthetic but materials yeah, the, so. the most you know, we, we want to have as many tools as possible. We don't want to limit ourselves to, well, we might as why bother going that route because we're only going to eat stuff that's that looks like this. Um, that limits our the scope of what we can do in terms of synthesis. All right, and so this is also the chapter where where we start seeing sequences of reactions. We'll do okay. Except excess Na NH2. So double double elimination, deprotonate at the end. And then you expose it to ethyl chloride. So you're going to do that substitution. And then you're going to do it to expose it to hydrogen with Lindler's catalyst, which is going to give you that partial hydrogenation. So a lot of times what you can do when you're when you're looking at these is pick out each step and write what the okay. I haven't put together what the final product is, but I know that step one makes a terminal deprotonated alkyne. Step two is gonna do that alkanide SN2. In step three is going to be partial hydrogenation making the cis product. So with that in mind, that that can be sort of a good roadmap. You can draw the individual intermediates out. We're probably going to want to do that as well, but just to sort of organize your thoughts so you don't just dive into it. Like, okay, I know what my overall process is going to be. My final product is going to be a cis alkene. Now I just have to draw the molecule um, along the way. So So after step one, we'd get something that looked like this. Then we're going to add an ethyl group to it. Because we did that SN2 with ethyl chloride. And then we're going to take that and make it into a cis alkene. 
and I'm going to clear this real quick so I have room to do this. So our final molecule would look something like that. So now that we have a couple of ways, we have a way to add carbons to our carbon structure, to our carbon skeleton. Um, and now we have a couple of tools with the alkynes that result from that. That gives us a whole lot more flexibility in terms of those synthesis problems, right? Um, the synthesis problems I gave you on Tuesday were pretty severely limited. You had to start with something with the right carbon skeleton, right? Yeah. Um, this kind of removes that restriction, which can be a little overwhelming. But that's that's why typically what you when you're doing a synthesis problem, the first thing you want to do is look at do I need to change the carbon skeleton? Because if you if you do, if you either need to chop carbons off or add carbons to it. We only have a few reactions for that. So that's sort of like a, a choke point where, you know, OK, I'm going to have to use this reaction at some point. And so the first steps are get my carbon skeleton right. And how can I do that in a way that I can then turn around and turn what's left into do the last couple steps? The carbon skeleton is the trickiest part, but also the most limiting. And sometimes limitations are helpful because it's not as overwhelming with all the possibilities. They'll go into certain restaurants to order. I'm like, that's the menu's too much. It's overwhelming. Yeah. Order. And their menu isn't even that big, but I feel that way about Getaway Cafe. I love so many things on their menu yeah. that it's like, I, I, I don't have a usual and I don't even know what to pick. Yeah. Decision paralysis. I guess. Uh, exactly. Exactly. All right. Um, so that the, Hydrogenation of those first three, the hydrogenation is really the only one that has a significant difference. The hydrohalogenation, we can do it just once pretty easily. We're going to get a statistical mixture where you wind up with some molecules unreacted and some molecules reacted twice, but the bulk of them will react once just based on, on law of averages. Um, and same with the halogenation. We can do that just just once if we want to to get you know an alkene with a bromine on each side there's nothing about the mechanisms that prevents that from happening the reactions that are similar to alkenes with slight differences are ozonolysis and hydration and the ozonolysis is pretty easy actually ozonolysis does the same thing um, except it, it further oxidizes instead of ending with with two carbonyls, you wind up, you're breaking three carbon-carbon bonds and replacing them with three carbon-oxygen bonds. And a three carbon-oxygen bonds looks like a carboxylic acid. So, you know, if we did have make it different on each side, so if we put this through, through ozonolysis, we're still going to break those carbon-carbon pi bonds and add oxygens to both sides. But since oxygen doesn't make triple bonds, uh, we wind up with, with the carboxylic acid. So we wind up with one, two, three carbon carboxylic acid. Then on the other side, we add one, two, three, four carbons. Then we'd make one, two, three, four. I went too close to the edge there to, to draw the other, the hydrogen, but it would be an OH as well. So, but really same exact reaction. Um, the mechanism looks even more complicated because it's still going to make those ozonides and do those rearrangements, but now there's another carbon-carbon pi bond involved at the same time. Um, so we're not going to get into the, the mechanism for this one, um, but it's same net result. Still a good way for chopping off chunks of the molecule 
the hydration though, it gives us carbonyls instead of alcohols. And that's a little bit harder to see why. Um, and so the, the steps all look pretty much the same. So for instance, if we're doing oxymercuration, um, actually, sorry, this is not oxymercuration. The, this is just the acid, this is confusing too. The acid catalyzed hydration needs mercury as a catalyst, but it's not true oxymercuration because you don't have to go through that demercuration step. It'll do that naturally on its own, but you do need to make that mercurinium ion intermediate similar to oxymercuration. Um, so the advantage of that is that for alkenes, or sorry, for alkynes, we don't need to differentiate between um, acid catalyzed hydration versus oxymercuration. They kind of, we need both of them in order for it to happen. Can't do the acid without the mercury. Exactly. Only specific for al alkynes. Just for alkynes. The, the nice part about that is that also means that you don't see anything really in terms of rearrangement. Um, and then, so the, the first part, kind of behaves just just like um, regular acid catalyzed hydration, you wind up adding, breaking one of the carbon-carbon pi bonds and putting an OH in its place. And so you get this molecule. And this molecule here is pretty unstable and you'll go through a proton transfer, again, similar to oxymercuration now. Um, Except we don't have to do the reduction step, just having acid present is enough to force it through the reduction step because you wind up breaking that second pi bond um, to add the proton, which results in this carbocation intermediate, which turns around and steals the electrons from the mercury to remake that pi bond. So because that second pi bond is there, the demercuration step is part of this process. So the mercury kind of has to hold on to the electrons. Mercury is holding on to the electrons. Um, even, but then once the second pi bond is broken just by being protonated by those, those second pi electrons acting as nucleophiles, um, or acting as a base rather, and you make this positive charge, this secondary carbocation, secondary in this case, but whatever type of carbocation is, that's less stable than the mercury being by itself. So then you wind up breaking the carbon mercury bond to move the electrons from the carbon mercury bond over to the, the carbocation. And you wind up making um, an alcohol attached to an alkene, which has the very creatively named functional group of enol. Um, and that's the enol. So all of this more or less makes sense. It's sort of like a weird fusion of two, what was two separate mechanisms, but they kind of behaves in a way that makes sense. Um, the enol doesn't stay as an enol though. And that's why we wind up with a carbonyl at the end, because an enol will go through what's called a tautomerization. And a tautomerization is effectively just, a, um, it can also just be called an isomerization. You wind up with the same formula before and after. You just are going to do a quick rearrangement to make something that's more stable. Carbon oxygen bonds are more stable, especially carbon oxygen pi bonds are more stable than carbon carbon pi bonds. And so you wind up with this this shape where, okay, if, if we take do the same step as we did to kick the mercury off, you if you protonate um, the alkene to make a carbocation, that carbocation then steals electrons from the one of the oxygen lone pairs to make a carbon oxygen pi bond. But then you've got an oxygen with three bonds, which just winds up being deprotonated. Right. And so the, the net result is you wind up with, and this is, this is a equilibrium process in any ketone, you have this happening some small fraction of the time, depending on what the ketone is, the exact ratio 
is going to be is going to change. But every ketone that has at least two carbon, uh, actually, all ketones have to have at least three carbons, because a ketone by definition means it's a carbonyl that's in the middle of a carbon chain, right? right. So every ketone has the ability to do this. And I think for acetone at equilibrium, it's like an 85 to 15 ratio. 85% of it is present as the ketone, but 15% of the of the acetone is actually in the enol form. Um, you need something that can act as a proton, but since most acid or most uh, acetone has small amounts of hydrogen or small amounts of water in it, there's always the ability for this to happen. In given time, it'll reach equilibrium. So the net result of this of the process is, okay, if we do a acid catalyzed mercury hydration, we, we do add an OH group, just like we would expect, but it's in the form of an enol, which then rearranges to make a ketone yeah. or not even a ketone necessarily. Um, if it's not in the middle of a carbon chain, you can wind up with this happening and making an aldehyde. Sure. Yeah. Um, and we see that's what we see with the hydroboration in particular, because hydroboration is the anti-Markovnikov, right? This one still went Markovnikov for the same reason as before, where you put that partial charge on, a, on the interior carbon, um, which means that that interior carbon, the more substituted carbon is a better target for the for your um, oxygen to come in and attach. Um, hydroboration is pretty much the same as it was, except once again, this one, this one doesn't change at all, really. The mechanism is the same. It's just all of your intermediates, your um, bor alkyl borate intermediates are going to have an alkene attached instead of just an R group. Um, and so it's still going to be anti-Markovnikov. But then once you get to the end, you still wind up with an enol. And once you get, to, if you end at an enol, you don't really end at an enol. It rearranges the same exact way, does the same exact process. And so you would wind up with an aldehyde if it's a primary carbon. Either way, you put a carbonyl on the least substituted carbon. That happens spontaneously. It doesn't need like certain conditions. It just needs a little bit of water present. It just needs a proton source, basically. If you have anything that can act as an acid, so any protic solvent really um, is enough for this to happen. And since there's almost always, unless we're being really, really careful. Um, and actually, I, I think you can even wind up with the enol itself acting as the acid for another enol molecule. That, that hydrogen that is on the alcohol part of the enol is an acidic hydrogen. It's not that acidic, but it's acidic enough that you can wind up donating it and causing this process to happen in equilibrium process. Um, so you just need something that can donate a proton and there's almost, if we're, yeah, this is, if you had just this pure substance, this is, um, a protic solvent on its own, right? When you think about it. So that's enough to, um, to allow it to reach that, that equilibrium, which again, I think the, the biggest number I've ever seen for the enol is 15% at equilibrium. Um, most of them are going to be significantly less than that, especially in the form of aldehydes. Um, so this is just practice drawing the tautomerization. So if you know what the end product is, you know it's going to be an acid transfer. Um, or even... This is actually has it as a base catalyzed tautomerization. So what would it look like if it was base catalyzed instead of acid catalyzed? Instead of hydrogen. Yeah, instead of instead of starting by breaking the the pi bond to leave a carbocation, you start by deprotonating the oxygen, and so you go through a carbanion intermediate instead of a 
um, instead of a carbocation intermediate. So, the difference between that? So a carbanion is negatively charged. On the oxygen or? or um, so, well, let's look. Oh, so yeah. If we start by, by deprotonating here, we're one, gonna wind up with with this, right? Right, okay. Which now if we have extra electrons here, they can move over and instead of pulling electron density away from the oxygen, the oxygen's pushing electron density into the pi bonds. So then you would get, you could wind up with a negative charge here. Which then we made water we made, um, by donating a proton, right? So there's something that can be a proton donor around. So really anything, if there's any proton source or proton um, acceptor present, it's enough to allow these tautomerizations to, to take place. And there's always something. Um, and since this this is that means that this is going to be driven by equilibrium, not by by rates or anything like that. So it'll eventually get to making more of the carbonyl form. Um, and really, I say eventually, it doesn't even take that long. Frankly, this is a pretty downhill in energy process. Carbonyls are way more stable than enols. And so then this is just the, the neater version. Yeah, you start with deprotonating. We make what's called the enolate ion. Eight just means we deprotonated something and it has a negative charge now, right? Nitric acid becomes nitrate yeah. and enol deprotonated is enolate. Enol eight. Which then has this resonance structure. I didn't draw this as a resonance structure, which is which was a missed opportunity on my end. Um, because really, we're just moving electrons. We didn't move any atoms to make any sigma bonds here, right? So that makes this a resonance structure, which has a good place to act as a nucleophile. It's pretty stable as a resonance structure. Yeah, exactly. And you know, both of these, everything has, it, this is the more stable resonance structure. But both of these have everything has a full valence. Okay. So it's not that unstable here. So maybe it's 60, 40 or 75, 70, 30 in terms of percentages. Um, but that's still enough that it allows us to make the more stable molecule at the end. And be, even though this might be the more stable resonance structure, that's the more stable actual structure. It's made from the less stable exactly. structure. Interesting. But it still provides that opportunity to, to rearrange. Yeah. Okay. Um, you could think of it. In, if you think of it in terms of like water flowing downhill, you could have you could have like a two lake system where one of the lakes is slightly higher than the other. That's less stable, right? And it could even it would be smaller probably, right? But if that smaller lake that's uphill in energy had the outflow that went way downhill in energy, that's still gonna be the most stable eventually. Yeah. Eventually everything is gonna level out and down the furthest downhill is gonna have the most water, even if it has to go through a slightly less stable state to get there. All right, let's see what the last few are. So these are just some practice, some practice problems. Again, with these reaction series, I really like these reaction series because they allow us to do to me to ask a few things in a row, and we have to follow the logic through, kind of like a mechanism. So I'll give you a few minutes, then I'll start working through these. <clears throat> 
So what was your final result for the first one? The first step was would be add a methyl group, right? Mm -hmm. So you get the propine. Second step, I guess, first and second step makes the propine. Second and third is going to start by making an enol, and it's hydroboration, so it's on the less substituted carbon. We're adding an alcohol. And then the, that enol spontaneously undergoes that rearrangement. So... The net result of, of hydroboration um, in terms of, of alkynes is instead of adding an OH to the more substituted carbon, you're going to break both pi bonds and add a carbonyl to the less substituted carbon. Because first thing happens, you break one of the pi bonds to make the enol, which then rearranges to make the, the carbonyl. Yeah. And the, so the thing to keep track of here is that for what's listed as B here for this, the top reaction series, that's anti-Markovnikov. So we're, getting, we're going to break both pi bonds and add a carbonyl on the less substituted carbon. On the second series, step three is based, is this is usually how we write it. It's mercury catalyzed acid hydration. Um, this one's going to still do the same thing, break both pi bonds and turn, turn them into a carbonyl, but it's going to be on the more substituted carbon. We get the Markovnikov carbonyl. So for the second one, we still start with two carbons. Now we're adding an ethyl instead of a methyl. So we get propyne. which is going to, when we, if we draw the enol intermediate, with the OH on the more substituted carbon, so that when it rearranges, instead of getting an aldehyde, we get a ketone. Mm -hmm. 
the extra wrinkles that we have to consider when it's an alkyne, just like carbocation rearrangements, they're a pain. They're tricky to keep track of. Um, and, you know, they're, they're details. And those details are what make it so that this is its own separate chapter, why we can't do one chapter on alkenes and alkynes. We've got to do alkenes first so that we understand how those mechanisms work. So when we get to alkynes, we can see why they're different. Um, they're still called the same thing. It's still a hydration reaction because it's the net result of both the hydroboration and the mercury catalyzed. The net result is still we added a water molecule. Um, it's just that in this case, we wind up adding the two hydrogens to one side and the oxygen to the other side because it goes through that tautomerization. Yeah. But it starts out the same exact way. Add an OH to one side of a pi bond, hydrogen to the other side of the pi bond, just that the remaining pi bond then allows it to rearrange. All right, and so I think I'm going to save this for the quiz this weekend. We'll do these ones on the, um, I'll probably just make this problem the quiz question this weekend. Yeah. Um, since you already had a homework assignment on alkenes, we'll focus on the alkynes on the quiz. Yeah. Um, are there any, any last thoughts or questions you had at this point, yeah, it's just like putting everything together yeah. and practicing, you know. When you do the quiz over the weekend, you'll come up with your quiz with your question for the quiz. Yeah. And we'll go over it on on Tuesday. Yeah, you know, like when you're walking it through, you know, it's like, oh, that totally makes sense. Like everything right. makes sense, and it, it falls into place. Then when you like try to like just start from a blank canvas and start from scratch, it's like it takes some practice. Yeah, it does. It does exactly. So that's why we'll we'll end here because there's not a whole lot of point in me walking through more examples yeah. when you've already seen them. I think, yeah, I get the...